you all um, had a copy of the minutes from the previous meeting. Yeah. Um, do you want to go through them page by page just to um, see if we can send? Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five. Are you, you can tell that they have an accurate record? Yeah. yeah. You can tell them as a sign. Yeah. We now move to the, to the main business. Peter, uh, if you have okay. Thank you, Yvonne was going to uh, give the detail of this. Yeah, uh, the, the, this report covers pensions issues that were raised in the summer budget um, and the recent two government consultations, one on pensions tax relief and the other on um, a cap on public sector exit payments. The main proposals in the budget which impact on the LGPS concern pool investments. And PEACE has been a key player in the informal consultation with the government uh, to set the criteria for pooling and is working with other form funds to formulate a cons consolidated approach in response to the consultation. And I don't know if PEACE, you want to pick that up at this point or move on around it on later. Perhaps if I pick that up now, as yeah. it's probably the most significant yeah. uh, item facing local government at the moment. So on page 10 of the papers that you've got, I included an extract from a report prepared by the Scheme Advisory Board, which really just sets out the, the main messages of, of what we know so far. Under key messages, section three, uh, criteria, as Yvonne said, are being set by the government at the moment, uh, and effectively those criteria are being agreed as we speak. As far as we're aware, they are, as set out their size, that they're looking for £30 billion pools of money. Um, the other criteria is cost savings, and, and based on a report prepared by Hyman Robertson a couple of years ago, there's an expectation of very substantial cost savings of, of hundreds of millions of pounds. And then the third criteria is around governance, that the proposals are intended to improve governance within the LGPS uh, at a number of levels. As it says there, a consultation is expected either later this month or early November. Um, responses are expected from pension funds early in the new year and expected that there'll be an announcement by government uh, in spring 2016. And uh, that's expected to coincide with the, the budget statement. So the, the, uh, the informal message is that the Chancellor wants something to say in March when he delivers his, uh, his budget statement. Uh, on page 12, they set out some, some potential models. This was really confirmed by the, the announcement by the Chancellor in Manchester last Monday when he spoke about six regional wealth funds. It, it's clear that government is looking for six or seven uh, regional multi-asset pools. Uh, as members will see, the seven relates to Wales, which, which is, is, is a special case. Uh, but there's also the potential for uh, funds with similar investment strategies to, uh, to join, i.e. in-house, or indeed um, there for there to be national frameworks. Uh, it's been described by, by Hyman Robertson as a you know, potentially a mixed economy, that there are some foreign funds that are merging uh, on, on a fund basis and others on an asset class basis, for example, infrastructure, if it's felt <coughs> a national infrastructure fund was the right thing, then that could potentially be, be one of the pooling options. Peter, if I, if I can just interrupt off, on this, um, I do have concerns. Um, first of all, that I would question whether there will be significant cost savings. I mean, I I agree with, with some of the, the much smaller 
funds specifically for London boroughs, it makes sense for them to be some degree of cooperation amongst those. But I mean, our fund is six billion, and I would question whether we would actually save anything on investment costs. Um, but perhaps more seriously, in, I, I would question whether or not this would lead to a fettering of the discretion of the pension committee, um, because what would be how easy would it be to disinvest from these funds or and actually what would be the the decision making process for investment i would all the cynic in me wonders whether or not this would be seen as a as an infrastructure pot for the government to um to dip into um easily uh, because pension investments in infrastructure have been talked about for a number of years, but there hasn't really been anything very significant about it yet. So I, I do question this. I wonder what your views on what I've said. I think they're very reasonable questions, and I think they're, they're taxing a number of individuals. Um, Unison have certainly already written expressing concern about the infrastructure proposals by the Chancellor. Um, I'm also aware that the LGA are of the opinion that if anything is mandated, then potentially the, um, both the assets and the liabilities of the LGPS will then come onto the national balance sheet, which is something that Treasury isn't keen for. So there are a number of different issues at play at the moment. I think you'll see from the letter that I've circulated, which was written uh, from DCLG Chris McGainey to um, to the LGA and obviously on to LGPS funds that they are, <coughs> they being DCLG, are being careful about the language that they're, that they're using. So they have rode back from uh, expressions such as uh, regional wealth funds uh, in relation to that matter of infrastructure. He's spoken about creating the conditions, one, to save millions of, hundreds of millions of pounds, and secondly, create conditions to, to potentially invest billions in infrastructure in the region. So I think DCLG are, are perhaps being a little bit more careful in, in their wording of those things. <coughs> uh, and it's something we're very much thinking about in our, our, our uh, preparation for the consultation. Uh, as a fund, we do have some in-house management. As a fund, we have some external management. And we are working with other funds to, to try and put a more accurate figure on cost savings. As you say, a very large figure has been put out there, but certainly our initial work suggests that although there are substantial savings, and as a fund we can certainly make savings as well, they're not, at this moment, we can't see them being the magnitude that, that's being spoken of. Um, just if I might step in through you, Chair. Um, under H, Peter, uh, the, somebody has said, whether that be a, a senior civil servant or a minister, that, that there is a preference for a simple solution. I, I, I've never known um, any government office talk about simple things before, where if they do, they don't mean it. Um, have you any comment to make on that in, in regard to the type of calls, which is the important issue as far as I, I can see? And I'm not. I'm trying not to be facetious. I find it difficult. Yes. Hmm. No, I think. We would share that view that, in a sense, the, the less formal any arrangements are, the more preferable it is that we have demonstrated an ability to work on a, on, a, on a voluntary basis, on a collaborative basis, so that a simple solution is more helpful in terms of working together rather than something that's, that's prescriptive and mandated. And I think, clearly, it's for our pensions co committee to make a decision, but when it comes to, to governance arrangements, I think that's one of the most important areas for us to consider that we should be working with, with like-minded funds, with like-minded investment strategies rather than with funds that just happen to be geographically close to us. I think um, there are advantages from being geographically close, but there are also advantages, important advantages of, of working with funds that share a similar philosophy because it's important we can work together. How do you establish that simple philosophy? I mean, how did you, do you have regular contact with other fund managers and talk these things through? Yes, in fact, there's, there's been a national initiative um, which is being coordinated by Howlings Robertson. Effectively, they're providing 
secretary and support to it, but quite a few local authority funds are involved in that, including ourselves, and we're having regular um, meetings. A number of work streams have been set up around dif different aspects. I mean, one work stream is around external active managers, one is around external passive, another is around in-house management, another around infrastructure, another around private equity and other alternative investments. So a number of us are, are dedicated to particular work streams with a view to bring that all together. There's a steering committee comprised of half a dozen LGPS funds that will pull that all together. The information will be in the public domain and hopefully it will help us to make a much more informed decision when it comes to actually responding to the consultation in February. Thanks, Chair. Um, another couple of points. One is the transition costs, the cost of disinvesting from our current investments to move into a, a pooled fund. I've not seen any consideration of, of that. And bear in mind the size of these funds across um, the entire LGPS, um, that could be quite considerable. And I touched on the other one before, but I think perhaps it might not be terribly important, but nonetheless, I think it should be considered as the uh, liquidity of such investments. Yes, at the moment the, the government's expectation is that liquid assets, as in equities and bonds, would be the first to be pulled. Mm. Transition costs was considered by Hyman's in a report they did a couple of years ago from government. Clearly they're substantial, but the government is taking a very long-term view, and I think not unreasonably are saying that, that the longer-term savings substantially offset the transition costs. We have asked the question of whether there'd be any contribution towards transition costs, uh, and DCOG are very clear that there'd be no, no contribution surprise, towards surprise. that. Yes. Sorry, was that, was that the question you were? That's good, thank you. Uh, yes, again, on uh, page 11, on uh, the item 5, the, the bullet point, um, the first bullet point, of the, the, they remain uh, unconvinced that there are any intrinsic benefits of scale, especially for those teams with already low costs. And um, we already do very well with our in-house teams, so how can they say there's no intrinsic benefits of scale? Yes, that, that's actually a, <coughs> a summary of a meeting that I attended. Um, well, actually, that was on the 17th. I attended the meeting on the 21st. but. Pension fund's response is that it's hard to see for in-house managed funds in particular that have very low costs, that by combining with other funds, those costs will come down any further. Right. Um, we do as best we can. Yes, but in anything, if anything, there will be more costs in terms of us coordinating with other funds. Uh, in, in a sense, there are cost savings for us in bringing external mandates in-house, but that, it needs to be seen on the net of Performance so you can read that bullet point two ways. Yes, I can see that. No, in the context, that was feedback from pension funds to DCLG. Okay, that answers your question. Thank you. Anyone else? One, one small point on on costs. I, I can see where investments are ma managed in house. There might be some um, savings through the economy at scale. But certainly, whether externally managed, most fund managers tend to work on a percentage basis. So I would have thought the scope for uh, savings there would be very minimal. Yes, DCLG have been speaking to, to investment managers, and, and some progress has been made. So, for example, LGPS share classes have been set up so that if you invest along with other funds, it's been demonstrated in London with the 32 London local authorities have looked at all their mandates, and where there are common mandates, they've gone and spoken to the managers. And managers have indicated, not in every case, in some cases, there will be discounts effectively for bringing mandates together, but that's partly because they're of a smaller size. But as a quid quo pro, there'll be le less client servicing potentially, so that effectively the LGPS will be one client, rather than the six, seven, or eight clients that there were previously, so that there'll be less client servicing from from those investment managers. But you're quite right, a number of strategies are capacity constrained and those managers are, are less willing to offer any sort of discount because they're aware they can sell their capacity at a higher price. 
think the point here is I don't think it, the actual pooling of the investment is really any great risk. Uh, in actual fact, it probably gives you greater opportunity in terms of the size of the fund. actually gives you greater opportunity in terms of your investment options. And I can certainly see that there are some issues around savings that you could potentially make from, from fees because the larger the fund, generally, you will, you will generate some fees. So, so I think on, on that basis, I think it's actually a, a wholly sensible idea. And we should benefit from it. I think the risk that we, we've always skipped over, which was one of the early ones that was mentioned, was this risk about if there is an, an issue in, in terms of investment strategy that comes from a body other than the pension funds. That's where the real risk is. So if, there's an, if this infrastructure um, idea comes through and, and says, well, actually, we will have to influence your investment decisions, that's the real risk, I think, in this, rather than the risk of there may not be any great savings from pooling investment. Because, I mean, it puts into, uh, I'd say, like a policy perspective, the political statements of George Osborne. Because clearly, you know, as the party comes, which, um, and it doesn't matter what party it is, the, the, the politicians have to make statements um, for, for, for the audience and, and, and set out their, their um, ag agendas in, in, a, in, a, in a political way. I think what Chris McGainey has done has interpreted that in a policy way. Um, but while sticking to what the Chancellor has said, he is he's put into a way which I think we'll move forward with. I mean, it is interesting what you did say, Pat, about infrastructure. Um, my, my thought about infrastructure is that yes, there is more capacity, I think, for funds to invest in, particularly some of the smaller funds who are not incapable of investing in it because um, those funds that, that I'm advising to, um, all three of them, London Boys, have actually invested in infrastructure. But, uh, but it isn't as widespread among smaller funds as it might be. Um, so I think it will encourage it, but the fact is that if funds were mandated to, to invest in infrastructure, and, and this letter doesn't suggest they will be, if they were, and they didn't generate the returns, well then funding deficits would go down, and that would have to be met ultimately through the employer contribution rate. So this would be a circular argument. So I don't honestly believe that the government could mandate um, pension funds to, to invest in infrastructure, because if they do, it's just going to come back round, back to the employing authorities, who then would have to make a decision when they put the employer contribution rates up about what further the public service cuts they're going to make. So there is a bit of a difficulty here. Um, I think there is an attempt to encourage infrastructure, which I think is good, but it's going to have to be infrastructure that meets you know, the funding requirements are set out in the, in the funding strategy statement for the actual evaluation. And it's interesting because um, members of the board will be aware you know, infrastructure covers a wide range of things. Local authority schemes have tended to invest in so-called brownfield sites, i.e. already developed infrastructure. It's clear from the Chancellor's statement that he's more interested in greenfield development, which is seen to be higher risk because it includes development. Now, it's not necessarily the case that that's a bad thing. You know, I think there are, are opportunities for some infrastructure. It's certainly the long-term sort of assets pension funds should be invested in. And it, it's a sensible thing for us to look at with bond yields so low. So it's, it, it's not a bad thing, it's just around how it's dealt with. And I think very helpfully, you know, the final paragraph of the letter, government remains keen to see authorities take the lead in identifying the best way to deliver savings. At the moment, the ball is in our court. We have the opportunity of coming up with different options, different proposals. The government's been quite clear that it sees a regional solution as, as the best thing. But if we feel there's a better way, we at least have an option to make a case and an opportunity to present that early in the new year. So we are working to see what's, what's right for, for Merseyside Pension Fund with a view to informing Pensions Committee. I mean, I think I'd say in the final comments, I think Merseyside are lucky in the fact that it is one of the largest funds, but it's also about significant internal management. And therefore, I think the, the views that, that Peter and the officers and um, indeed the committee can put forward um, are probably going to receive more consideration, perhaps, than, and, and, and actually carry more sort of thought because it's involved in a much more wider sort of basis of investment than, than elsewhere. So I think um, perhaps you'll, you'll be less affected, or most of will be less affected than, than some other funds, which I think will we'll see a very radical change to the way they actually in the past, I think the change here will be, will be less radical.
On page two, there is a recommendation of the board of members to report it. Are you content to make the report? Um, agenda item two, the annual report, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I didn't propose to uh, go through our annual report in detail. Uh, you'll be aware that there's a statutory process for us to go through where the report and accounts are prepared by uh, officers of the fund. They're then subject to audit by external audit. They're then taken to, to committee for final review and, and approval. They then uh, comprise part of Wirral's accounts because Wirral is the administering authority. Uh, so what you have here is effectively the finished product of that. There's a fair amount of information in there. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions on it. Uh, Donna and her team are the ones who have done all the work on it mainly. Um, Sorry, Peter. Please finish if you don't say anything. No. I was right. going to say it's a snapshot okay. of the fund right. as of the 31st of March. Okay, excellent report. Um, uh, a number of questions, that, if, if, and I do please forgive me if some of these are a bit naive, but it is the first one um, for this fund that I've read. Um, in the admin report, it mentioned that all data to be reviewed and sent electronically between the funds and employers. I was just wondering how well is that project um, progressing? We have um, an electronic information um, process going on with the major bad employers where they are submitting electronically all new styles as LGB4s. We are going to be progressing to for them to send us termination details electronically. Um, but that is that project is just mainly now with the major five authorities because as we know the five authorities have eighty percent of our membership. We will then be moving on to looking at an alternative process for the smaller employers of how we deal with electronic interchanges. Um, it may be not appropriate to have the same process that we have for the larger Obviously. employers, so we're looking for a different process. That, that sounds good progress. Thanks for that. Um, Next one. Um, Perhaps you just refer to what page on the agenda? Oh, yes, I, I will do. So yes, so yes, yes certainly. Um, page 58 under the notes. Uh, note 12. Um, the fund is seeking to recover tax withheld by UK and overseas tax regimes under EU principles of free movement of capital. Uh, but that's dropping. Um, it was 343,000 last year, and it's down to 233. In 2014-15, just one, wondering why that's dropping. Is it is it getting more difficult, or is it that our levels of investment are, or or did we recover more from previous years last year than this than, than this year? Yes, it's the latter point that we right. made some historical recoveries. It's interesting that those European tax authorities that have paid out have then amended their legislation to remove the the unfairness in it, so there are no future claims because they've equalised tax arrangements. Right. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, got one, one or two others. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the page, uh, but I remember there was a point about um, future, it was on the budget for um, the next three years, and it was about investment manager fees, um, and it shows that um, growing by, from memory something like 12 or 13 million by about a million over the next two years. Uh, I was wondering why, is that, is that because we're anticipating a significant rise in the value of the assets and therefore <coughs> pro rata the investment managers fees would go up? Yes exactly, but effectively we've adopted our actuaries assumptions in terms right. of growth over time um, and therefore it's a very, very conservative figure because we do expect to achieve some cost savings. Those aren't far reflected in that. It's just a fairly mechanistic um, projection of asset growth based on existing pro rata manager fees. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I can just pick up on that one, actually, on the uh, 11B, on the uh, investment expenses. Do we ever get a breakdown um, on the management fees as to what the actual trans transaction costs are? Is that possible? I know it's not shown in the accounts. It's just, 
think in some cases a lot of the, uh, the managers I'm told aren't very well forward in coming up with that sort of information when requested. If you look on page 26 of the annual report. Right. Sorry, it's just page 16 of the um, so, no, Is it sorry, no, page <coughs> 60, yeah. Page 60 of the pension report. It does actually detail their uh, transaction oh, right. cost figure amounted to 3.7 million. Oh, brilliant. Thanks very much for that, Donna. And their work is currently underway by the team at the moment to see whether we can sort of break that down further. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? Um, well, I've got a couple of pieces. Um, if you turn to page 40 of, of the pack, um, if you look at the membership statistics, you'll see there is a trend. Um, Page 40. If you look at the membership statistics, you'll see there's a trend of active effectiveness to have gone down in the past five years. Um, pensioners to have gone up, deferreds to have gone up. I mean, clearly that trend, I suspect, will continue and perhaps accelerate, which in common these pieces, over the next five years, as, as, as the government cuts the public spending, but I generally mm -hmm. comment on that. Um, I mean, what potential implications might that increasing maturity have both for the fund cash flow and the investment strategy. And also while you answer that, I'll draw your attention to, to page 57. Um, I, I might be misinterpreted this, but um, if you look there at table seven and just look at normal employee contributions and then table nine, benefits by just pensions, it looks to me on those, but I may have misinterpreted it, that the fund is already clearly in a negative cash flow mm -hmm. position just on normal employee employee contributions and, and pensions. So really the question for us is about maturity um, the question fifty seven relates to are we already in negative cash flow? Yes, it's helpful to take those together. The short answer is based on <coughs> contributions and pension payments, yes, we're in we're a, in deficit. We have substantial investment income about £120 million pounds a year, which bridges that gap uh, and should do for, for the immediate future. But no, it's something that we're very aware of, that the fund has matured more quickly than we projected three years ago, and it's something we will be addressing, particularly in, in the next actuarial evaluation. Um, in, in the interim, I've asked the investment team to look at uh, that investment income with a view to ensuring that it, it comes in a more accumulated way rather than us needing to dispose of assets um, because market timing may not necessarily be ideal if we take that approach. Is that sufficient no, answer, John? Fine. Um, if we look on page 76, please, I'm interested in the number of um, bodies that are within the fund. I mean, it, 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 it said on page 53 that the number of employees is 262 by the end of March 2015. And if you go to, to, to say page 76, there's a list of the bodies there. And we have scheduled bodies, brackets, academy 51. Um, the government, I understand, has you know, indicated that it will require all schools in England mm -hmm. to become academies. I mean, we've got 51 already, Donna. Um, sorry, um, Yvonne. Um, Donna might be easy. Um, how many do you think you could go to? Because is, is this going to make you know, the, the burden on, on, on the admin function? even greater. Is, yeah. is, is it going to be a significant expansion potentially? Well, yeah, obviously the more schools that go off to academy status and move away from the local authorities, that means that every school that goes out to academy, we have a new employer, new set of accounts to do for them, new annual returns, new discretions, additional support to give to their employers. They then may outsource their payroll, so you have additional support to backing to give to and um, the payroll provider, so yes, it does create further administration uh, and impact on the funds and additional resources required to support their new employers. Do you have any idea how many more academies it could be potentially, even in Wilson or across the Mesa? In Liverpool, has got over 100 primary schools. What are still in the local authority? Most of which are still under local authority. Most of the secondary schools are academies now. Um, so most of the academisation will be in the primary sector, I think. 
So if you if you go roughly across Merseyside, I would guess that would be in the region of three four hundred primaries. It's difficult to, for us to identify yeah. from all of the education yeah. records because we don't separate schools out yeah. from the rest of the membership base. So I couldn't give you a. The one established is that it's going to be. It's going to be. Should I better make extend the point a little bit further as well? Because I mean, clearly they they would be to an extent driven by central government arrangements in terms of the, the new education offer. Um, but as local authorities begin to look at internally uh, how best to deliver services, um, you know, we've seen a growing number of uh, alternative delivery models mm -hmm. uh, and, and the scheme is certainly working with Wirral in terms of developing those. I know local authorities are doing the same. Um, and I mean, two elements of that are clearly it's an administrative headache for the fund, mm -hmm. um, which seems to be counter to, 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 to earlier discussions around you know, sort of merging the funds together uh, and getting the administration cheaper. But secondly as well, I think it also brings the challenge, which comes back to your, your elements about cash flow job, in terms of uh, what those alternative delivery models will do. Mm -hmm. Will they guarantee that all of the employees in the future will be local government pension fund employees? And, and the reality is, is that that may not be the case. So I think it's a double edge, so not only will it bring administrative burden, it may release some funds back into back in, in council X or council Y, but in terms of benefit funds cash flow, it could have a significant impact as well. So it's quite quite a double whammy really, double work and, and, and less less income. Yeah. And that's helpful trying to the maturity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I presume Yvonne that it's very rare for a, a, a local authority to outsource and maintain an open fund because it's almost self-defeating. So yeah. it should become almost certainly become a closed employer. And so Joe's point about yeah. maturity is just going to get well, that's, later. That's mm. the evidence I've, I've seen up to date, yeah, about the ADMs that they do particularly want to go for close schemes, as you say, because economically that that the points are outsourcing to alternative models. Obviously there's other business reasons for rationale for doing it but for the pension side of it it's cheaper to provide all kinds of pensions than the LGPS scheme. But doesn't that increase the risk to, to the funds because of the fragmentation within the education sector? Um, that there are, there is, there's less these academies and free schools for instance if they leave the fund or if they cease to trade whatever the equivalent term the is moment, in education. At the moment, DFA have given us a guarantee that they would stand behind these academies at the moment. Right. That we have had a DFA assurance that these academies are guaranteed by the DFA. Could I just make one further point and it follows on with what Joe was saying? It seems to me that you're going to have a situation developing where not all of these Let's forget about academies and schools and whatnot. Uh, where these other bodies, where councils will be looking towards them to provide services, they're not going to say, right, you've got this forever and ever, amen. It's going to be a short term arrangement. And they're likely to be in and out, um, more out than in sometimes, perhaps. Um, but it's another problem, in my opinion. shows that even if the overall numbers don't change, we appear to have roughly the same number of members of the fund, you know, not too many different employees, and actually underneath there's a lot going on, members coming out, members coming in, every time a contract is re-let by an authority, as Yvonne says, there's a termination, the members sort of leave and the members come straight back in again, there's a lot of administrative work that goes on behind the scenes. So it's really the over the last few years, we've been doing more with, with the same resources, and that's one way in which we have you know, improved our efficiency, but there is more going on, even though superficially, that changes may not seem to be quite so substantial. Could, could I just say one thing? Uh, just thinking about what happens with the, the, um, uh, the committee, um, it's always been, uh, uh, always, to my knowledge, 
been a, a, a matter that one expressed thanks uh, and congratulations to the accountant uh, on, on the preparation of these accounts. Um, and I don't see any reason why the board cannot do the same thing. Agreed. Say thank you on behalf of Donna. She's too shy to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she nodded. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to come to you this time? Oh, I've just got one other thing to say on page 47. Um, I, I, I thought it was personally um, that they interested in the reports and the IDRP, um, which, which given that you know, there are 45,000 active members and, and 36,000 in person. There have been very few um, IDRP cases um, resolved or, or, or called. Um, I, I noticed that there um, has been a, a number of ones at both stage one and two, and it appears that decisions have been made. We've only had one case that was the Ombudsman, one case that once had the Ombudsman, which was, was upheld. And I think that is um, testament, both in the, the relatively few that there are, and the fact that the one that's not the Ombudsman is upheld. Mean, Testament to A, the employers, um, and B, the fund in terms of actually running in some dispute resolution procedure um, properly, because as we know from um, Code of Practice number 14 and the pensions regulators' um, guidance on the implementation of their responsibility, one of the things that's particularly interesting is the IDRP. Um, and, and this does give me um, cause for um, thinking that the fund is in a good position at this point and that employers also are taking this um, in this appropriate consideration. There is actually at the moment also DCLG uh, run a survey around the IDRP process whether it is fit for purpose uh, in relation to how because we have a two stage process and whether that process is it more merit to just have a one stage process rather going through to the employees coming directly to the fund and particularly under ill health where uh, to split the decision between terminating somebody, terminating their employment and then, make, and then the employer having the decision, decision over the pension position whether it comes back to the fund and also to have rather than how every employer has their own medical panel but to have one national panel so you've got consistency so that's going on in the background around the DCLG. We're expecting to hear a decision on that shortly. Um, there's two recommendations there. There's a recommendation that we know the annual but also the recommendation that we um, give our thanks to the accountants and the fund officers. Are you content to, to agree those two recommendations? Agree. Yeah. We turn now to item three on page 85. Um, Tips and hospitality policy. Um, yes, thank you. We felt it was right to to include this um, as best practice. It's something that we have in place for officers and for committee. Um, we do have members of committee that aren't necessarily uh, councillors, and therefore there needed to be a policy in place for them. And we feel it's appropriate to have a similar policy for Pension Board. The intention is to keep things very straightforward so that if um, hospitality is enjoyed in relation to Pension Board business, then that is recorded. But we also seek to make a difference between attendance at conferences or investment managers often um, run either conferences themselves or have uh, related training opportunities, that those are recorded as training rather than as hospitality, just to make it clear that it's not hospitality as understood in the normal definition of hospitality. Uh, as I say, the proposal is that where members um, receive hospitality or attend a, a training conference event in relation to pension board business, then we will keep a register of that and uh, we'll ask members to uh, make a return um, on a monthly basis. Uh, I imagine the great majority of those will be, be, be nil returns, um, but, but it, it is for members to, to discuss and, and to approve and if there are improvements, if, if, if members would prefer it to be 
phrased in a different way, then that's certainly something we can consider. One question, Chair, if I may. Um, will that record of hospitality, will that be on the website? It's publicly? Y yes, it will. Viewable. Yes. Okay, that's fine, thank you. In the way that we will bring a report mm. um, to, to the Pension Board on an annual basis of those returns, mm. and that will be in the public. Yes. Thank you. Chair, did you say, will it be a good form or do you just, you just email? Yes, there will be a pro forma. Right. Manages that for us, um. so uh, <laughs> be more of the same, I'm afraid. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Are you content then to, to approve the recommendation on page 88? Read. Read, yeah, read, yes. Item 4, please, business plan. Yes, thank you. You'll be aware that this report doesn't differ significantly from the report I brought to the previous meeting. The appendix sets out some of the, the key activities and projects, so that's page 91 that the fund uh, has identified and is undertaking at the moment. I think there are one of the key things that we're working on at the moment is uh, an expansion of the, the key performance indicators for the administration team. That's something that Don is giving some thoughts at the moment. Uh, and the proposal is that we'll bring a, uh, an enhanced report with covering a, a wider range of the fund's activities in, in, in a draft form to the next pension board meeting and that will hopefully be, be more useful for members in um, looking at some of these uh, indicators. I mean, the chair has helpfully drawn attention to things like IDRP and it could be that there are indicators around that that, that will provide information uh, to the board the fund's wider administration activities. We tend to measure the things that are more easily measurable, but they're not always the... Uh, Reflective the, of the way staff's getting on, the, uh, we're looking to look at where we're actually resources and where discourse movements in our membership base and our employee base. applications, you, you know, actually haven't been carried, so I've seen that on one or two other funds. I, I don't think it's actually become an issue that people thought it would be, no, but it is reassuring. I know one of the funds I'm an independent advisor, one of the members was, I think, you know, at the beginning, rightly concerned that lots of people would suddenly come to, you know, to your company fund and ask for their money and go off and spend it, and um, that's their choice, obviously, after advice, but, you know, um, I think the fund's been able to assure him that, um, Actually, there isn't an awful um, lot of that. And also, it's an awful lot of work for yourself because there are certain processes you have to go through and make sure you get them right. That might be something you, you just report on. Yeah, as well. We, well, actually, we have undertaken a process, and Don has brought the auditor in to make sure that our process is actually robust in relation to freezing and choice. We have um, provided all new options for anybody retiring under freezing and choice. We've updated all our communication materials, our websites, we put more robust um, robust um, communications in within our discharge forms as well and making sure that the members who are going off to these schemes that offer the flexibilities do 